Welcome to uh, Galvanize Campus. My name is Mike Tamir. I actually um, I run data science education and products here at Galvanize. Um, what I'm going to talk to talk about today is efficient text classification with word to vec um, This is coming out of some project work that I did with Personograph on app text classification and web, web page text classification. Um, so I want to thank uh, my partners at Personograph for providing the data and for uh, working, uh, working on this project with us. All right, so what I'm going to go through today, quick outline. We're going to uh, go through the basics of text classification. What are the challenges? What are the basic problems? Um, some deep learning applica applications for text classification, how to deal with the, um, the data challenges. Uh, using Doctivec, in particular using Doctivec, uh, viewed under the auspices of a, um, a compression algorithm. Uh, benchmarking uh, for different label sparsity and imbalance problems, in particular against a bag of words, um, and then talking a little bit about how these um, experimental results impact uh, out of sample um, out of sample uh, 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 performance uh, with Doctivec engineering, and then we will go through the conclusions. So, just a quick overview of you know what is the supervised paradigm for document classification um, you know you start with your standard pre-processing you do your stemming your uh, punctuation um, you alter capitalization there there are libraries out there that will do this that will not uh, not reduce the a in Apple when it's uh, when it's the proper name Apple because that's confused with the fruit um, then you go in through your feature engineering there is a whole grab bag of options that we can do here PCA sparsity filtering TFIDF is a very popular one um, transforming scaling uh, turn it into bag of words look at context uh, the list goes on uh, then you do your model training based on how the model training works. You go into a loop uh, with your feature selection, regularizing, feature importance, uh, looking at correlation modeling, et cetera. Um, and then ultimately, hopefully, you have a very strong classifier. The unsupervised case is a little bit simpler. You uh, don't have the option of checking and iterating on your results, so it tends to fall under the you know the standards are LDA and document clustering um, without much guidance or supervised uh, target features to uh, help guide whether or not your clustering has been successful and um, whether or not you're, um, you, you, whether or not you have something that you want to bring to market for performance. Um, one of the major challenges uh, in document classification is the data. So number one, your data quality usually has the standard challenges of the shape of the feature matrix, right? You're usually going to have very wide uh, matrices um, compared to how deep they are. Um, you know, data uh, vocabularies, even small ones, are going to be order of the tens of thousands, and so you need quite a num uh, quite a large number of uh, examples for that uh, vocabulary if you're going to use just raw uh, bag of words or um, terms in the uh, as your feature space uh, so the shape is wrong so to speak is how we, we look at it uh, this deal this uh, affects cursive dimensionality in particular because uh, you're dealing with now a 50,000 say um, feature uh, uh, vector space and um, that means you're going to need uh, you know powers of that in order to really be able to cha to, to fight the cursive dimensionality you also have data sparsity, and what I mean here is that it's um, not every document is going to have even a fraction of the total number of terms in your vocabulary. So you deal with a bunch of zeros and then only a couple ones in, in your rows, and that's going to have all the effects and challenges that you see when you're dealing with a sparse feature set, sparse data points in your feature set. Um, and then there's lack of training example. This is when you're in the supervised case. If you want to um, to train for uh, nodes in your taxonomy that are, you know, let's say you have a taxonomy that's hundreds or thousands of nodes wide, that means you're going to need training examples for each of those nodes in a supervised count context, at least in a traditional um, applications. And that can be very challenging. Usually you don't have that. There are some open source uh, data sets, uh, Demos and Reuters, but uh, it can be very difficult to, to get um, enough training examples for every one of the um, for every one of the, uh, the the nodes, every one of the taxonomy class uh, uh, features that you want to, sorry, target features that you want to uh, classify for. 
And then the last thing is, uh, just like you're going to have only a sparsity on the number of terms that exist in each document uh, out of the whole vocabulary, you're also going to have an imbalance in your data set itself. You're going to have far fewer positive examples for any particular uh, topic than you are going to have negative examples. You're, so you're going to have to deal with, uh, with this imbalanced data set and do a lot of the challenges that, that come from doing a super, supervised learning uh, paradigm when you're doing this, imp this supervised, uh, this uh, imbalanced uh, data set. So let's talk about uh, deep learning for a moment. Um, I'm going to go through one example. Uh, I know um, Adam Gibson gave a, gave a great talk earlier today on, or was, maybe it was yesterday actually, um, on, uh, on, on deep learning. So I'm not going to go into this too much, but I'm going to be talking about Wirtevec as a kind of compression algorithm. So I just want to go quickly through what uh, autoencoding is as a compression algorithm and why, um, how we can compare and contrast what's going on here versus word to vec So autoencoding, the simplest kind of autoencoder, uh, has this shape. You have your input features, x. You squeeze it through the keyhole. You have some sort of matrix w. It's going to be n by n, where, um, where, where um, the n is less than n. And then that's going to squeeze it down to this next feature set, Y. Um, and then you reverse that process. You, uh, you do a WT, so that's a transpose. It's going to reverse that process and get you through Z. Now, what's going to happen here is then you check how much of the information were you able to, so to speak, squeeze through the keyhole by mapping X down to Y and then back up to Z. Um, and this is just going to be pick your favorite loss for how much you want for how you want to measure what would count as information loss going from the beginning of the process to the end of the process, and you optimize for that. You tune just like you would tune any neural network uh, with back propagation. Uh, now, I guess it's a little over a decade ago. Um, uh, uh, um, Jeffrey Hinton came up with the great idea that, well, we'd like to make this deeper. We'd like to be able to squeeze it more. Um, so why worry about all the problems of having many, many layers all at once? We're going to do the trick that we're going to clamp these outside Ws. And now we're going to do the process again. But instead, so we have that first W uh, at stage one clamped. And so also you have uh, w, uh, W1 inverse clamped. And now we do the whole process again, and now we're really essentially just doing a three-layer um, three tuning again for uh, W2 and W2 uh, transpose. So you can iterate this process over and over and over again to get 2n plus 1 different layers, squeeze it through a keyhole y as small as you, your heart desires, and then you can just train it in order to make sure that you don't have too much loss in your compression. When you're done, you don't have to keep the right-hand side of that bow tie shape. You toss it. You, have, you compress it down to the smallest uh, layer that you want. And then you feed it through your preferred algorithm. This can be just another layer of tuning as a neural net. It could, you could throw it into, you know, pick your favorite classifier, random forest, logistic regression, GBMs. And you have essentially a feature engineering where you've compressed high dimensions down to low dimensions that now, hopefully, ideally, when things go well, your classifier can bite into and can, get, can find the grooves in the data. Um, so yeah, you can fine tune with back prop. What are the downsides of this? Number one, it can be very unstable. Uh, number two, it can be difficult to implement. Number three, uh, the cost scales with the order of the taxonomy node count. And what this means is that it's going to be very, very costly if you have tens of thousands, or if you have, if you have hundreds or thousands of different uh, taxonomies that you want to compress for. You've got to repeat this entire process without any uh, savings every single time you do it. So this suggests using a different method, and that's why I'm going to talk about word to vec um, Continuous vector representations for individual terms. What that means is we take our um, projection of each term, so that's all zeros and then a one. Uh, it's a, say, if your vocabulary size is 50,000, it's a 50,000 long vector with a one in exactly one space. Each different term maps to a vector, um, a, 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 a axis vector, so to speak, uh, that is orthogonal from all the other axis vectors, all the other words. Um, and this is very long, but uh, what we're doing here is we're going to take a step to compress from, say, if we have 50,000 words down to usually on the order of 50 to a, to a few hundred um, dimensional vector space. 
This is a diagram of the actual algorithm. Word to Vec actually came out as sort of a side effect of um, a side effect of doing a skip gram or an n-gram uh, model for you using neural nets. So real quickly, I'm going to walk us through this diagram. We take our terms. So this is, I think, the constitution or something. We take our terms. We take the first uh, j terms, or um, sorry, the first n terms. Um, and you get in this blue here. Um, you map them in, with the projection uh, mapping to each of these terms. Then you stack them together. So if we have three terms and we have a 50,000 word vocabulary, this is a 150,000 wor lo word long, or 550,000 dimension long vector. We then create a, um, a, a matrix, uh, the word to vec matrix, that projects that, um, or squeezes that, 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 um, that vector down to usually a few hundred long vector, which is the word to vec embedding. You didn't run it through a, um, an, an activation function, something that is nonlinear. Um, and then you add in uh, usually a max sense um, or um, classifier out here to get a probability for wj, which is the jth word, the next word that you expect to be. So you see uh, Jack and Jill ran up the blank. This algorithm is trained to guess hill, most likely, more likely than any other term in the vocabulary. And um, if you train it over and over and over again with enough, uh, enough examples of text, it will learn to do this pretty decent accuracy. Now, um, the fact that we're using this as a skip gram or an n-gram model, skip gram is the same thing, only instead of saying Jack and Jill went up the blank, it's Jack and blank went up the hill. Um, the, uh, you know, that's not really the, the, uh, the you know, Wartvec is a side effect of that. It's a very valuable side effect, though, because what we've done is we've compressed this high dimensional feature space down to a few hundred features, and the few hundred features actually do more than just um, give us a small dimensionality to work with. It actually encapsulate, uh, or captures the structure that you see between different terms based on the frequency with which they come together. So um, this is a GIF, uh, thanks to, there's the link. Um, it's a really good one, though. Um, uh, so uh, one of the uh, classic or very uh, uh, you know, uh, nice examples of how this structure between our terms is captured is, you know, when we go into a vector space, especially a vector space that's not just made up of the axes terms, we have all this structure in a vector space. We can add them, we can subtract them, we can scale them, we can shrink them, uh, we can rotate vectors, and all of this structure actually can get encoded in the algebraic structure of the terms as th when they get embedded into the vector space. So we have uh, king plus man minus woman. So in other words, what's a king plus the difference between a man and a woman? You can yell it out. Queen, that's right. It's a good guess, and that's, uh, that's exactly right. Um, um, so, um, so there's the difference between man and woman. There's a the difference between king and queen. We look at the difference vector there. We take the king vector. We add the man minus woman vector. And we get epsilon close to the queen vector. Um, this is something that you actually see over and over again. There is a set direction for pluralization. Uh, you can get analogies. It's very good at solving analogies in this way. Um, so Paris is to France as, um, as, as uh, uh, you know, Washington DC is to America or as London is to England or is to uh, Great Britain. Um, and you can actually uh, mimic this in the structure of the word to vec embedding very nicely. So um, now let's go into something that's a little bit newer in the, in the, uh, uh, the cycle of, this, of, of word to vec, which is doc to vec. Doc to vec is a process of, remember I said that we have all these algebraic things that we can do with our words now that we can't do with simple, um, simple uh, categorical identification of these, of these terms. We can add them, we can subtract them, and we can take linear combinations of them. Here I'm going to use an example of just taking the average, but you can do all sorts of cool things with the linear combination. So um, we have our text. I'm going to remove all the stop words just to make it a little bit simpler. Stop words tend to be very stubby anyway uh, in word to vec embeddings. Uh, we're going to embed them with the word to vec uh, mapping. And now we're just going to add them up to get the document vector. And of course, the document vector is going to be much longer and add, include a couple more words uh, when we're doing, um, when we're doing uh, uh, the, the best of times, worst of times, but uh, it's very, uh, you know, you can do this, you normalize it, and then you get a, a vector that's 
ostensibly pointing in the direction in this 300 dimensional vector space uh, that, the, that, the word, that the document tends to point in, so to speak. Um, so this aggregate vector actually ends up, the, the, as, the, as you add these terms over and over and over again, most of the terms are just gonna be kind of noise. It's gonna cancel out. It's gonna be kind of like a random walk, but it's a random walk with drift. And that drift is actually going to take the sum vector, the ag aggregate vector, in the direction that the actual entire text, the entire book, maybe, uh, is pointing in. And then, so all the other things all that, that, go, that go along with, um, you know, with the random walk end up getting canceled out, but in aggregate, you end up getting this, uh, this total, total topic uh, direction pointing. So we might say, oh, this, this book uh, you know, uh, is about uh, Tale of Two Cities, it's about class struggle. We take the vector, we normalize it, and it turns out that we are epsilon close uh, in the neighborhood of the vector class struggle. Um, and now you can, you can measure it in a lot of different ways, taking the average in a simple, simple way. You can take the cosine between the two, uh, whatever you want in order to see uh, how close is this drift vector to the taxonomy nodes, uh, or taxonomy directions that you do. And another nice byproduct of word to vec is not only can you embed entire words, you can, or sorry, entire documents by taking these linear combinations, you can also embed individual terms like the taxonomy terms and compare them on an equal footing because you've embedded them into that vector space as well. All right, so um, just another quick diagram. You're going to take the word to vec um, matrix. Uh, those of you who are paying really good attention, uh, word to vec is actually uh, in this diagram. In this diagram, actually, we have like, you know, in this case, three of these word to vec uh, matrices stacked on top of each other because we're embedding three terms. Uh, but then you can chop it if you have three an n gram. Or you can have n uh, n word to grep, uh, word to vec uh, matrices. You, you stack them and uh, or, or you, you destack them and, and average them to get this uh, this indi individual embedding vec uh, embedding matrix. Um, then you can use whatever classifier you want, random FARs, GBMs, whatever it is that, uh, logistic regression, whatever it is that, that is your favorite or seems to be performing best, um, and you get your, uh, your classification, whether or not it falls in that, um, in that term, or, uh, sorry, in that uh, class, of class or not. It turns out that the dominant feature usually in these embeddings is proximity to the, um, the taxonomy term that you're actually talking about, uh, which is unsurprising and actually very beneficial. Um, so what are some of the benefits? Uh, sparse vectors uh, end up being made dense. Training time is restricted to the output layer only, so it's only, you, instead of retraining and re-auto-encoding every single time, the word to vec happens once, no matter how, so it doesn't have to scale with the number of taxonomy nodes that you have. Um, there's no expensive hyperparameter search uh, in tuning this, or do, sorry, doing the fine tuning, and it's more effective in using sparse labels. Uh, how much more effective? This is a good graph of that. Um, if you look on the x-axis, that's the number of positive training examples we have. We are talking about dozens to hundreds here. So incredibly, incredibly small. small. You even have Demos data set uh, number of positive examples at this order of magnitude. Um, and then comparing it just to bag of words, this is the percent across all of the taxonomy um, that, uh, that in this use case we are using uh, that were accurately um, classified. So it dominates all across the board. All right, another big value to this procedure is dealing with imbalanced text problems. Uh, like, as I said, usually you have way more positive, sorry, way more negative examples than positive examples. Um, so this is an example with cat class struggle. Uh, if you have one in 10,000 of your terms is, um, or sorry, of your documents is a class struggle document, uh, and the model has, say, 95% uh, precision on a balanced test set, then for every one true positive, you're, gonna, you're still gonna have a 0 0.05 uh, or 500 false positives uh, of your total document set, uh, which means your precision gets knocked to 0.2%. Um, this is something that happens even if you use traditional best practices with downsampling, et cetera. Um, so because the imbalance of real model performance can be far worse than estimation based on uh, balance testing, rethresholding can help these models, but now you have to figure out where to rethreshold, and that's something that um, that if you're using 
a lot of features in your feature space, if you're using a, lo a large volume feature, is going to be very difficult to detect. Um, this is just another way of saying that we have an, uh, an overfitting problem. Um, so just to make this very, uh, very uh, um, visual uh, to illustrate what the point here is, um, we have on the left side a bag of words, classic bag of words, feature engineering with 300 features, the top 300 most uh, predictive features. And now here we have with 10 features. Um, how we read this graph, the greens are the negatives, the purples are the positives, and these are the scores um, the, the, that we're getting. So, uh, or sorry, the amount that, are, that we are, it's a histogram of the ones that get that score. So, um, so you see maybe over. Um, so what that means is that we, we have, that's a true positive case, but all these purples on the left side, those are, are um, false negatives, and the greens on the right side are false positives. When we try to um, feature select and find just our best terms, maybe our top 10, it actually gets much worse, um, and you see that you've got, with this, um, with this feature engineering, you've got a lot of uh, false negatives on the, on the left-hand side and the false positives trail off to the right-hand side. The F1s are not so great either. The, it takes a significant hit from 0.93 to uh, 0.885. If you do it just with bag of uh, sorry, just with uh, feature engineering on this bag of words, um, you immediately get better results. Um, first of all, the hit to the F1 score is far smaller, uh, less than 0 0.02. Um, you also get that um, the separation. So you're already getting very good separation there. There's a little bit of overlap in the 0.4 to 0.5 range. Um, but when you knock it down, there's a clear cutoff point here at the 0.5, a little bit higher than 0.5 range. And this is something that gets, this is an example of something that, you, a phenomenon that you see over and over again with every taxonomy. Um, so now it becomes very easy. You just fit the distribution. You look at the overlap for the, um, for where the, these, these have a kind of a beta distribution shape to them. And then you chop it right there. Um, so you get this unambiguous thresholding between the positive and the negative cases. You get a confident semi-supervised estimate of the imbalance ratio. So even though uh, you only have maybe dozens to 100 examples, that's really all it takes in order to be able to separate between the positives and the negatives, assuming that the uh, imbalance ratios are not themselves very highly unrepresentative. Um, and this is just an example with uh, songs of an actual uh, distribution that, you, that you'll see across the entire taxonomy. So in conclusion, um, pre-training word to vec uh, provides a low investment uh, entry into deep text classification by circumventing the pre-training phrase uh, that you would get with actual deep, uh, deep learning um, text, class text classification or compression algorithms like uh, uh, denoising autoencoders or RBMs. Um, results are competitive in the F1 for highly optimized w uh, a bag of words, and they severely dominate when you have tr small training sets and also when you have imbalanced training sets. So uh, feature selection and, well, uh, feature, and uh, feature engineering for word to vec features avoids the washout effects when you have these severely imbalanced 1 in 10,000 examples uh, in your training features, uh, and requires far less investment in the training examples for the boundary cases. And last but not least, um, it enables more efficient scaling for a large space of, uh, of text classification taxonomy. So in, for business uses, um, you know, often you need hundreds if not thousands of different taxonomy nodes, and this is something that can be prohibitive if you need to do the investment of traditional text classification for every single one of those nodes. So thank you very much, uh, and happy to take questions. Okay.